straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. R. Kelly's fate sealed. Today's guilty verdict forever brands R. Kelly as a predator. What the guilty verdict means for the R&B singer and gripping witness testimony in the Mennonite murder trial. You know, I think I was hoping that the person was sleeping. Hear from the camper who discovered Sasha Krause's body. Plus, decades later, President Ronald Reagan's attempted assassin will be unconditionally released. Why his attorneys say it's a step in the right direction. And later... The laundries did not help us find Gabby. They're sure is not going to help us find Brian. The FBI search for Brian Laundry stretches into another day as Gabby Petito's family speaks for the first time since. Along with Terry Austin. Guilty. That's the verdict for famed R&B singer R. Kelly. And after nine hours of deliberation, a jury found Kelly guilty on all charges. The trial lasted for six weeks as Kelly faced a slew of sex crimes, including sex trafficking and racketeering, specifically forming an enterprise to traffic minors for sex. The jury found Kelly guilty of all nine counts against him, which included eight violations of the Mann Act, an anti-sex trafficking law. Fifty witnesses took the stand, including former employees, and 11 victims all detailed what they witnessed and experienced with the singer. Emotional testimonies in the courtroom were accusers detailed being locked in rooms without food or water for days, and other times when Kelly knowingly transmitted STDs to his victims. Kelly's sentencing is set to take place on May 4th, where he faces life in prison. After the verdict, U.S. Attorney, U.S. Attorney, Jacqueline Casulis sent a message to the brave victims who testified. Today's guilty verdict forever brands R. Kelly as a predator who used his fame and fortune to prey on the young, the vulnerable, and the voiceless for his own sexual gratification. To the victims in this case, your voices were heard and justice was finally served. This conviction would not have been possible without the bravery and resilience of R. Kelly's victims. I applaud their courage in revealing in open court the painful, intimate, and horrific details of their lives with him. No one deserves what they experienced at his hands or the threats and harassment they faced in telling the truth. Well, on top of this week's conviction, Kelly faces other state and federal charges in Chicago, Illinois. Now we're joined by co-host Terry Austin and legal analyst Julie Rendleman. And Julie, this is a huge victory in terms of the so-called Me Too movement. What could a case like this mean for the future of sexual assault cases, especially as some accusers don't pursue charges until years later? So look, I mean, I think it started with Harvey Weinstein. I, I think we were watching uh, the change begin then because this was a case that was different than the normal ones we usually saw uh, going to trial. Older cases, more complicated cases. And the unique thing about R. Kelly's case is, you know, the federal prosecutors used a law that they really never use. They used a racketeering law, um, which is usually saved for cases like the mafia. So this really tells individuals, certainly those who are committing these type of crimes, that they're going to go after you and they're going to go after you in different ways. And this shows not only are they going to go after you, but they're going to be potentially successful, regardless of how many years ago the alleged crimes occurred. And Terry, what's next for R. Kelly and how many years is he facing in prison? Well, he is facing dozens of years. We know it's 20 years for the racketeering 10 for the Mann Act violations, and there were eight of those counts. So we know he will be in prison for quite some time. But he is facing charges in Northern District of Illinois, which is federal court for child pornography and obstruction of justice. And also in Cook County, Illinois, which is a state court, he is facing charges there for sexual abuse. And don't forget, he is also facing charges in Minnesota for prostitution involving a 17-year-old girl. All right, thanks, Terry. And again, he will be sentenced for what happened at the federal trial in May 4th of next year. All right, now an update 
In the Pike County massacre, the eldest son of George Wagner asked the court to dismiss his murder charges and the possibility for the death penalty. Attorneys for George Wagner IV now say he did not shoot or kill any of the victims, despite 2019 court documents that say he shot each victim personally. Wagner and the rest of his family were charged in the 2016 Roden family murders of seven adults and a teenage boy. A motion filed by Wagner's attorneys say in order to seek the death penalty, DNA, biological or video evidence needs to be provided linking Wagner to the murders. All this comes after Wagner's mother, Angela, and brother Jake pleaded guilty to charges earlier this year. And in California, Joseph Jimenez officially pleads not guilty to the murders of TikTok stars Riley Goodrich and Anthony Barajas. The two teenagers were shot and killed in July while at a movie theater in Southern California. Goodrich died at the scene and Barajas died after being taken to the hospital. Jimenez appeared in court on Monday where his attorney entered the pleas for him. The 20-year-old pleads not guilty to the murders on the grounds of insanity. Attorneys are set to meet again on October 22nd to discuss the appointment of a defense psychiatrist. Well, still ahead on Long Crime Daily, the man who shot President Ronald Reagan set to be unconditionally released. But first, the Mennonite murder trial will bring you the chilling testimony of the woman who discovered Sasha Krause's body. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Shocking new witness testimony details the moments a camper found the body of a Mennonite woman. This in the trial of a former United States airman accused of her murder. 22-year-old Mark Gooch is accused of kidnapping and murdering 27-year-old Sasha Kraus, a member of a New Mexico Mennonite community. Now, Gooch is charged with first-degree murder, kidnapping, and theft. He pleaded not guilty to all charges. Krauss was last seen shopping for Sunday school supplies in January of last year, and about a month later, her body was found near Flagstaff, Arizona. Now, at the time, Gooch was stationed at an Air Force base in Phoenix. An autopsy revealed Krauss died of blunt force trauma and a gunshot wound to the head. A crime lab reported that the bullet taken from Krauss's skull was fired from a gun that Gooch had in his possession. Cell phone records put Gooch in the area at the suspected time of the crime. On Tuesday, Cynthia Schultz took the stand describing the moment she realized she had discovered Krause's lifeless body. So I had clothes hanging out on a tablecloth somewhere, and I saw this white thing, and I thought to them, um, is that the tablecloth I put out? And I thought, no, I wasn't back in this area. It's not here, it was like on a rock. And so I walked closer to see what it was, and, um, and then when I got closer, I could see it wasn't either of those. And, um, and I could tell it was a, a body, and, and it was like face down. All right, let's bring back Julie and Terry. Terry, how do you think the jury responded to Cynthia Schultz's testimony? You know, she was very emotional. It was hard to understand, as you saw in that clip. 
but she said that she was looking for her white tablecloth that she had washed and put out to dry. She realized it wasn't a white tablecloth. It was someone's body. She went over closer and recognized the fact that it was a woman's body. And so she actually was very, very emotional. I think the jury was looking at her and feeling how she was feeling when she actually discovered the body. She also said that she has microwave syndrome, which means she's hypersensitive to electrical current, currents. And so I think that the judge was very respectful of that. She told the jury actually to make sure their cell phones were off. So I think everyone sympathized with her and listened very carefully to everything she had to say. Yeah, and Julie, Ms. Schultz testified that she did not touch the victim's body. Now, how important is that from a forensics perspective? It's incredibly important. You know, any time you have a body found, a, a crime scene basically is created. And the last thing any crime scene investigator, a forensic pathologist wants is for someone to contaminate the scene. And so by her not touching the body, she avoided the potential for DNA to be put there, hair to be put there, fibers. Now, obviously, the body was out there for a period of time, so there's elements that are going to impact forensics, but certainly this helped them in continuing on in their investigation. Thanks so much, Julian Terry. Now coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the Petito press conference, how the family is paying tribute to Gabby's memory. Plus, an attempted presidential assassination. Decades later, John Hinckley Jr. is granted unconditional release. We have all that and more after this. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. The man who tried to kill President Reagan to impress a famous actress can now live freely without restrictions. As Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy tells us, the decision has drawn mixed reactions from the late president's children. President Reagan was nearly killed when John Hinckley Jr. shot him in March of 1981. Three other people were wounded, including the White House press secretary, a police officer, and a Secret Service agent. John Hinckley Jr. shot President Reagan because he wanted to impress actress Jodie Foster. White House Press Secretary James Brady was paralyzed by the shooting. Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity at trial and spent nearly 30 years in a mental hospital. But now the Justice Department and a federal judge say Hinckley's mental disease is in full remission and has been for 30 years. Hinckley was released to live with family in 2016 under strict conditions. Last year, he started posting music online with the approval of the court. President Reagan's son Michael tweeted, My father forgave Hinckley and would approve, therefore so do I. But President Reagan's daughter does not and believes Hinckley is still a danger, writing in the Washington Post. I will always picture Hinckley's cold eyes as he blew open White House Press Secretary Jim Brady's head as he wounded Secret Service Special Agent Tim McCarthy and Metropolitan Police Department Officer Thomas Delahanty. I will always picture my father being shoved into the limousine after a shot struck his lung and nearly grazed his heart. The restrictions on John Hinckley Jr. will be lifted next June. His attorney calls this a victory for mental health and says Hinckley has offered heartfelt apologies. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. All right, thanks, Anjanette. Let's bring back legal analyst Julie Rendleman and our Terry Austin. Terry, what type of impact does correspondence from the family have on the decision to fully release someone in Hinckley's position? You know, I think unlike a parole situation, the court is not really going to be bound by what the family is saying, although I do think they are influenced by what the family is thinking. We know that there's mixed opinions here. The foundation for Ronald Reagan said it was saddened to see that this decision had been made. And as you saw in the clip there, the children really had mixed feelings about the situation. But the Justice Department agreed to end the court and medical supervision. And Hinckley was already out, and he was staying with his mother before she passed away. This is just really the final step. And I think what the court looked at was this 2020 medical assessment that said he really did not 
pose a danger to society. So that is how they made this final decision to say he no longer has to be supervised. And Julie, Hinckley's attorney says this unconditional release is a huge win in terms of mental health. What could a case like this mean for future cases or even current ones with defendants citing mental health issues for their pleas? So it's a great question. You know, we've talked about this before, the fact that many times an individual who pleads uh, guilty by reason of mental disease or defect often ends up in a mental health facility longer in many cases than they do in jail. And so I'm not exactly sure what the sentence would have been had he been found guilty without that mental disease, uh, you know, uh, I impacting the decision. But in the end, he really did. This This case happened to over 40 years ago. And it, it indicates several things. One, it shows that an individual can get healthy. Um, and keep in mind, this is not some fluke that they just decided to, to free him. This has been going on for years where they've been opening up the doors for him and slowly unrestricting him. Um, so, you know, many think that his time has come. All right, now let's turn to Pennsylvania, where four teenagers now charged in a conspiracy to attack their high school on the 25th anniversary of the Columbine shooting. Well, the teens plan to attack Dunmore High School on April 20th of 2024, marking the anniversary of the 1999 school shooting that killed 13. 15-year-old Alyssa Kucharski and Xavier Lewis are charged as adults due to the seriousness of their actions and their, quote, level of culpability. Kucharski's mother found text messages of the teens talking about, quote, shooting up the school. Bomb-making equipment and a completed Molotov cocktail were found in the 15-year-old's home. The other two teens are facing juvenile charges and have not been identified. Well, when we come back, more on the disappearance and death of Gabby Petito. How the family says her memory can live on through the Gabby Petito Foundation. And welcome back. The manhunt continues as it's now been two weeks since anyone has seen or heard from Brian Laundrie. Meanwhile, Gabby Petito's family launches the Gabby Petito Foundation to help find other missing persons. In a press conference on Tuesday, Petito's parents and step-parents debuted matching tattoos in honor of her life cut short. The family commended the work of law enforcement and social media tracking in Gabby's disappearance, saying they hope the same effort can be put into other missing persons cases. I want to ask everyone to help all of the people that are missing and need help. And like I said before, it's on all of you, everyone that's in this room, to do that. <coughs> And, and if you don't do that for other people that are missing, that's a shame. Because it's not just Gabby that deserves that. So look to yourselves on why not that's not being, that's not being done. In that same press conference, the Petito family attorney expressed doubt that Brian Laundrie's parents would assist in the FBI search. But the Laundries maintain they do not know Brian's whereabouts. In a statement to Law & Crime Daily, the Laundrie family attorney said, quote, Chris and Roberta Laundrie do not know where Brian is. They are concerned about Brian, hope the FBI can locate him. The speculation by the public and some in the press that the parents assisted Brian in leaving the family home or in avoiding arrest on a warrant that was issued after Brian had already been missing for several days is just wrong. So, Julie, I have a two-part question for you. Brian Laundrie has been missing for two weeks now. What are the odds he will be found and found alive? And some conspiracy theories say he's hiding out in his parents' attic. If that were true, what some sort of ramific ramifications excuse me, could Laundrie's parents face? So I'd be absolutely guessing uh, in terms of whether he's alive or not. I, I really honestly can't figure it out. I can't figure out if he committed a horrible crime and has disappeared and is living on his own, um, you know, in the wilderness, or if something, you know, terrible happened to him. I, I, I hope we do find out. I think 
you know, the bigger question is the second part, which is, you know, what about the parents? Look, the parents have no obligation to say anything to anyone about their son. However, if they do say something and it's to a federal agent and it's not true, then they can get themselves in trouble. A lot of people talk about the idea of accessory after the fact. Florida state makes it difficult for that type of crime to be charged with regards to parents. But the federal law is actually a little bit easier. I'm not saying they're gonna be charged. I'm not saying they committed a crime. But again, we'll see where the evidence lays out eventually. Yeah, a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And uh, speaking of that, Terry, the authorities, they've released very little information so far. Do you think they're withholding information? And if so, why? I do think they're withholding some information. Obviously, they're still looking for answers, but they're being very strategic about the way they are releasing the information. We know that the autopsy is pending, and that is going to give us the details about the cause of death. All we know right now is they've determined that the manner of death was homicide, meaning that she died at the hands of another. But I think they are waiting and withholding information because ultimately when they do capture Brian, they want him to reveal information to them. All right, thank you so much, Julian. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.